Hi there, I'm Jim, one of the solutions engineers with Edge Impulse, and today I'm going to take you through a project where we look at how you go from nothing to a fully working prototype uh, counting objects on a conveyor belt. So on this conveyor belt, I've got uh, little bolts as our objects stuck down to the conveyor belt in various configurations. And uh, mounted up above the conveyor belt, I've got an Arduino Niclavision, which is an M7 based board uh, with a camera. So the idea here is that we want to create a model that is robust enough that we can then count um, objects going past on the conveyor belt past the camera so that we can get a count of the objects that have been uh, placed on the conveyor belt. So the way I'm going to go about this is a little bit different to normal. Traditionally, you would need to gather a load of image data from your um, setup. So in this case, I'd need to collect lots of images of the background and lots of images of bolts in different locations. But sometimes when you're creating an industrial product like this, getting data can be really costly. So what we can do is to get a baseline data set, do something called data synthesis. So if I go over to this Python notebook, what I've done is created a, a, a small script, which I'll walk you through, which uses uh, a, a tool called Image Magic to auto-generate our data set. So what I did first up before we started was take a couple of images from uh, the Niclavision board of just the background and of the bolt. And I did this for a number of different orientations of the bolt, the side, the top, and the bottom. I then sliced out the picture of the bolt and the idea is that we're going to use image magic to composite together um, random arrangements of our bolt in different positions on the background to create our data set. Now this might seem crude but at the low resolution that we're working with it, it's actually really really effective. So I'll just walk you through how I did it. So first off we had to install a couple of different dependencies. Wand is just a Python um, wrapper for image magic. Matplotlib I'm using to just plot something later on to show you. And then uh, I need to install image magic itself and the dependencies of that. So once that's all done, as we can see here, we don't want to be placing our objects anywhere that isn't sort of within the range of our um, conveyor belt itself. So what I've done is I've written a little script to draw a bounding box based on the sort of pixel values that you give it. So these are the dimensions that I'm then going to use later on because I, I know that if any of the bolts are placed within that area, it's going to be okay. So I've got my dimensions for that. And now we can load in a, a, a test image and do this once to see how it performs. So going through this, we're just uh, loading in a background image, loading in one of uh, the bolt images, creating a canvas to composite them together, um, and then basically uh, for a, putting a random number of bolts onto the canvas and making sure that they don't overlap with each other on the belt itself. So we've got one here, but if we run this again, we should get a different one. So we can just run this cell. There we go, we get three now. Now I thought, okay, this is great, but um, in real life, the belt is going to be moving. So maybe we could add some more effects to this to make it more realistic data set. So you can add in motion blur, for example, to give the, the belt some blur in the direction of the movement of the objects. And that could help with kind of building up an accurate data set of what the realistic uh, data is going to look like. So what I've now done is just extend that into a script which doesn't just create one image, but creates, in this case, we're going to create a data set of 400 images. And we're going to have a maximum number of eight um, bolts on the data, on the belt at one time. Um, and I've brought in not just one background image, but a number of different ones from uh, different areas and different speeds, just to give it a bit of variety. And I've got my bottom, top, and side views of my bolt. I'm giving each one a label. And then this JSON file here that we're going to create is the basis of our bounding box labels. Um, so Edge Impulse uh, has an uploader tool in the command line, which lets you really easily bulk upload files. And you can pass it a bounding box .labels file, which is just a JSON file with all of the data of where the bounding boxes are around each object. 
And the nice thing about creating your data set here is the labeling is done pretty much automatically because we know exactly where we placed each bolt on the data set. Uh, so we can feed that in as the label of where the bounding box is. So yes, we're just going through for n number of images, taking our background image, uh, putting in the dimensions of where objects can be placed, adding in a random uh, motion blur amount for each, uh, each image, applying that motion blur not just to the background image, but also uh, to each bolt itself as we place them. Uh, and then the bolt is, uh, a different view is taken of each bolt. We rotate it randomly, place it somewhere in the X and Y coordinates uh, within the defined area that we're given, and just check that they overlap. And if they overlap, we uh, discard that bolt and try again, um, because we don't want to have any kind of overlapping uh, to confuse the data set at this stage. Uh, and then if there's no overlap, then we composite them together and go again until there's uh, the requisite number of bolts uh, on the screen. And then we save that file to an output folder and add the um, X, Y, width and height bounding box to our label JSON file. Um, and then at the end, we, we save that JSON file. So we've run that script and I'll just show you a bit of an example of what we get out the other side. So this is just a short script which is going to plot a grid of the images. And you can see here we've got what looks to be a really wide data set of bolts in loads of different positions with you know, different amounts of blur. This should be a really good starting point for uh, creating our object detection model within Edge Impulse. And we didn't have to do anything manually. It's great. So then all we need to do in order to upload is run uh, just CD into our output folder and then run the uploader and the star just says upload anything within the folder um, that is an applicable uh, PNG file in this case and it will automatically detect that there is a bounding boxes dot labels file in there and upload those bounding boxes with it. So I'll just run this now. Okay, so we've managed to upload nearly all of our files there. And if we go over into our conveyor belt demo project, which I set up earlier. Okay, so we brought our data into Edge Impulse with the uploader. It's been automatically split 80-20 train test. And um, all of the nuts have been automatically labeled based on the uh, uh, bounding box labels file that we uploaded earlier. And we've got a really nice broad data set with lots of different variety. And it's available in the test data too. You can see there we've got the motion blur, which is adding a bit of variance in. So now to design our impulse, we're going to use the default image width and height because we've only got an M7 chip in the Nikla Vision. Uh, so we've got limited power, but this should run really well. Um, we're going to use the image pre-processing block and then object detection for images and click save. Run through, and we're going to choose RGB color depth to start with. We might find that it performs better on a grayscale image, but we'll see. Generate our features. Okay, now that we've created our features, we're going to generate our model, and we'll leave the standard um, model selections. And we're using the faster objects, more objects uh, edge impulse model, which is based on mobile net v2 and it's really well optimized for low power MCUs and it gives a really powerful result um, without very much hardware. So we'll train that up. Our model's trained now and uh, the performance here suggests that we're gonna have around seven to eight frames a second perhaps um, and it'll fit within our device. So that's really positive. And we've got some strong indicative performance here. So we're just gonna run the model testing to see how we perform on unseen data. And then on unseen data, it's performed very well, 100% accuracy. So this bodes well for deployment. Now all we need to do is go to our deployment um, and I'm going to use OpenMV to show you how this works because it gives us a nice visualization. But you could deploy this either on pre-built firmware for any number of different devices, not just the Nikla Vision, or uh, in a C++ or Arduino library or for anything that um, you want to run it on really. And that's the real benefit of our platform. And we have a huge number of supported boards just for vision these days. Uh, anything from the Nikla vision to over here, 
if I uh, put myself on the screen, I've got an, a Sony Sprasense board, which is a really nice little board with uh, quite a lot of power and could run this maybe at a higher resolution. Or even uh, I've got the HiMax board here as well with a camera on it. There's loads of different boards and uh, there's really one for any kind of problem or solution that you want to have in any chipset. And uh, even if it's not there, you can build it yourself and bring just the library along with you and integrate it into your custom embedded hardware. So as I said, I'm just going to export this as an OpenMV library. Click build. We'll just wait for that to build. Okay, so this is what's inside the uh, OpenMV library. We have a pre-built Python script. We have a labels.txt file, which just has our two background and M5NUT labels and a TF Lite file. And these two need to be copied across to the flash storage on our uh, OpenMV compatible board, which I've got over here. So if we just drag those across. So there we go, you can see in here we've got our TF Lite file and our uh, labels.txt already to go in there. So now I'm going to go across to OpenMV, and this is what uh, it looks like when you open up OpenMV. You get a nice live feed of the actual camera. So we can see here, things going through, and that's really good. So what I did earlier was write a script which is going to uh, help us count the objects on the screen, not just uh, detect the number of objects. So our FOMO model is really good at showing where objects are, but um, in this case we've got a conveyor belt and we want to maybe count how many products we're making, for example. So I want to count how many objects go past a certain threshold on the screen. So in order to do that, uh, I'll take you through this little script that I've written. So we just set up and initialize our camera up here at the top, uh, load in our model. This is all developed from the included OpenMV script, which comes when you download the firmware. And I just edited it to add in a few other bits. So the important bit here is um, top Y is the threshold on this image, which is a 240 by 240 image, uh, as that's what the uh, Nikola Vision outputs. Uh, the threshold on this image past which we want to detect um, an object as counted. So I've got it set at 100 pixels, which is sort of somewhere roughly in the middle. I've split up the um, frame into columns. So we have five columns here, and that means that we can detect up to five uh, objects going past this thing at once. You could increase that number if you wanted more granularity, but based on the size of our objects, I think five's about right. And then the detect factor is a factor of the width and the height between frames uh, above which it, it, the, the program will treat um, one object in a previous frame and another object in the next frame as the same object moving. So with object detection here, it happens frame by frame. There's no object persistence built in by default. So we have to kind of uh, create our own object pers persistence. And the way I've done that here is um, we take uh, the point at which um, the object is in one frame and then we detect if there are any objects within 1.5 times the width and the height of the object uh, in a circle around it in the next frame and if there is then we treat that as the same object and if it moves from below to above the y threshold then we count that as a counted object and I found that this works pretty robustly so yeah in this while loop we take a snapshot from the uh, image sensor, we take a frame, um, we already initialized a, an array for the previous blobs, so those are previously detected um, items in the last frame. We also initialize one every frame for the current blob, so whatever is currently being detected. Then we go through uh, the inferencing and spit out uh, all of the objects that have been detected in that frame their x, y's and the widths and heights, uh, calculate their center. We draw a circle on this screen over here to indicate to you where they are. But then this is the uh, counting algorithm here. So we check which column the blob is in. We check if the uh, blobs within those uh, parameters of the previous uh, frames blobs. And uh, if it is, and it's also um, moved beyond the line, then we increment the count for that column by one. 
um, and then we append all of the blobs to the current blobs and um, update the previous blobs to the current blobs as a frame uh, so that we have a save of that. Uh, so then uh, on the screen we just print a sum of the counts across all of the columns. I also in the terminal um, print out the count pipe by the column. So I'll show you that. So to upload this script to uh, the device, all we need to do is connect our device, click play. And you can see here, we're detecting two objects here. I'll make this bigger. We're running at about seven FPS. Current object count is zero. And down here you can see the columns. Uh, we've got zero across the board. So if I start my um, conveyor belt up, two objects have now been counted and we're about to get a third one, three, and you can see down at the bottom left here, we can see uh, which columns they've been counted in, which might be useful information. Four, and that was one on its side, five, six, Seven, eight, nine. So there we go. We've managed to create an object detection and uh, object counting algorithm based on FOMO, and we managed to do it from nothing. So the key takeaways from this for me are, firstly, that um, object detection is no longer just something that requires incredibly powerful hardware. You can do it on the MCU level and get some really reliable results, which is really powerful. The second takeaway for me is that not being able to access the environment in which your end product is going to be used is not necessarily a barrier to creating a data set that's useful to train a model. In this case, we were able to train a model with just four images that was able to count objects on this um, conveyor belt very reliably without having to take thousands of source images. And this could be expanded out to images of products with defects in, or even you could synthetically create defects in products. You, you, could, you could draw in cracks or whatever um, and create your uh, defect data set synthetically or, or add in new products that haven't even been released yet. So you have the CAD model of them uh, from the pre-production CAD model. You could use um, a program to render that uh, photo realistically and then apply that to your data set so that you could then count um, products that are unreleased as they get released into the production environment. Um, there's a huge amount of potential here and I hope this was a really interesting insight into how quickly you can use Edge Impulse to get up to speed and to create your first sort of proof of value concepts really easily and then how potentially it could scale up. So this script I've run locally here, but our platform has the ability to create transformation blocks, which are Docker containers containing code or uh, scripts or whatever, um, such as this one, which can run automatically either periodically or whenever new data is added to your data set in your S3 bucket. And it can pull that data set down, create copies of that data set with variations or create more synthetic data based on that data set and then put that into your uh, existing project, retrain it, send you an email with the updated um, model characteristics, the accuracy, and then automatically potentially deploy that to your Edge device with an updated uh, TF Lite binary or with updated firmware. And that's the place where Edge Impulse really um, adds value for an enterprise customer, is the ability to scale up from really quick development prototypes to production. Uh, in no time at all really. And performing all of those actions yourself uh, in-house would be incredibly complicated and as you scale up gets just exponentially more complicated. So I hope that was an interesting overview of the platform and uh, some of the sort of more interesting ways that you can apply uh, edge machine learning to different kinds of problems and ways to approach data collection. Uh, it's been a pleasure uh, showing you through this and I've been Jim, one of the solutions engineers. Thank you very much and I'll see you again very soon. I'm <laughs> sorry.